Good morning and welcome to the Trusted CI webinar um, for October 26, 2020. I'm your host, Jeanette dopp -Heide. Trusted CI is the NSF Cybersecurity Center of Excellence, and these webinars are part of its mission to deliver high quality, actionable guidance regarding cybersecurity to the NSF community. More information about Trusted CI can be found at trustedci.org. Today's topic is enforcing security and privacy policies to protect research data with UN Tian. Uh, Yuen is, a, is an assistant professor of computer science at University of Virginia. Her research focuses on security and privacy and its interactions with systems and machine learning. Before we begin, I have a few things to note. First, this presentation is being recorded. Second, participants are welcome to ask questions during the session using the chat box that uh, you see um, in, your, uh, in your Zoom interface. Um, we do are we are planning on um, ask, taking questions at the end of the presentation as well. Um, and with that, I will hand things over to Yuan. Yuan, welcome. Thanks, Jenna, for the introduction, and thanks everyone for joining my presentation today. So I will share my screen first. Okay. I think you can see my slides now, right? Yep, we can see them. Yes. Um, so I really appreciate the opportunity to come here today. And I will talk about our NSF funded project, enforcing security and privacy policies to protect research data. I saw that we have lots of great uh, participants in today's seminar, including researchers, IT experts, and industry experts. So I really want to use this opportunity to actually discuss together about what should we do to protect research data and enforce policies. Welcome everyone. These days the research apps are emerging. For example, we have seen mobile apps trying to diagnose uh, mental health conditions. And with the spread of the pandemic, we also have lots of pandemic uh, tracing, contact tracing apps. For example, University of Virginia will also have a health check apps for employee and students to keep track of their health conditions. And with the development of machine learning and artificial intelligence, there's also lots of augmented reality kind of applications on mobile apps, on IoT apps, and also even on VR and AR. So these apps, they provide lots of great research opportunities. These research apps really enable researchers to get lots of useful research results and also provide useful features to the users. However, they are also introduce security and privacy issues for users and institutions. For example, it could really go horrible if the research apps goes wrong. In November 2017, there was a mobile app that trying to release the heat map of people who do exercise. But externally, it's actually disclosed a military base in Singapore that could not be found on Google map. The fact is that there are soldiers trying to run or jogging uh, around the military base with their uh, fitness tracking kind of uh, devices and apps. And this mobile app that trying to just display how active people are actually disclose the location of military base. This is just one example of mobile apps. But in reality, the emergence of the IoT devices actually open up new, lots of new opportunities for such security and privacy risks. For example, I don't know how many of you actually use smart speakers, but these um, apps on um, smart speakers such as Alexa and Google Home keep listening users' conversations even after users quit the conversations. And this kind of recordings were also used uh, as evidences in the court, for example, for a murder case uh, last year. So it seemed to be the case that these research apps might accidentally collect more data from the user and might even disclose this sensitive data. 
Violations of privacy is very common when developers are not careful because these research apps make ex extract personal alternative data such as cameras, GPS locations, Bluetooth information, and motion sensors. You might say motion sensor is not that dangerous, but it was reported that motion sensors can be used to actually infer the password you tap on your phone. And the second issue is that compliance with, with regulations such as GDPR, CCPA, or HIPAA can be really tricky. And for the research apps, most of the developers are just researchers or students. They are not experienced security engineers who are really trained with background of security privacy and then don't have lots of experiences even developing this kind of apps. And they just want to have a research prototypes to launch their research activities. Before I talk about how we help to resolve these problems, I also have questions for you. The first question is that who is responsible for such security and privacy issues in your institution? And the second question is that during your daily practice, how do you actually check or avoid these issues? So uh, feel free to type out your answers and join the discussion uh, because I also want to know like what's, how does it actually work and to your institution for preventing these risks in the research apps. Yes, I think Jim mentioned about um, IRB is responsible. And uh, Wasoka mentioned that everybody is responsible. Um, and I think some of the universities and, uh, and, and, um, and companies, they also have a chief security, information security officer is also checking this kind of things. Nicola have a similar opinion that everybody is responsible from end users to developers. Okay, how about for the second question? And, and first I want to thank everyone for joining this discussion. And uh, how about the second question? In your daily work, how do you actually check or avoid these issues currently? I'm actually a security and privacy researcher, but even I actually have a hard time actually make sure my students write a secure code. <laughs> or like trying to comply with the best practice for privacy when they actually develop research apps. But we usually do like code reviews um, so that we make sure these apps actually looking okay for security and privacy issues. Okay, I will talk about um, the current solutions I observe in UVA and the limitations and how do we want to resolve these problems. So similar to James' answer, and UVA, like we have the industry uh, institutional review board, IRB, actually try to protect the participants in the research apps. However, there are lots of limitations. First, the IRB process are very time consuming and there's no guarantee that researchers will really follow the IRB protocols because in the end, researchers just uh, submit, mostly just submit a document talking about how they're going to collect the data, how they're going to use the data, and how they're going to protect the data. But there's no guarantee that these uh, researchers will really follow the IRB protocols. And even when researchers try to follow what they promised in the IRB protocol, they might accidentally build apps that over collect data or has vulnerabilities that might disclose the user's data. So the current solution have lots of limitations and barely works. 
So in this project, the question we want to solve is how can we enforce the security and privacy policies automatically on research apps, generally on research software. We come up with this solution that contains two thrusts. Overall, we want to be able to first understand this um, document to extract security and privacy relevant policies. For example, we want to be able to use nature language processing to be able to look into the IRB protocols, the app descriptions, and maybe the data management plan to check what kind of security and privacy policies the developers, the researchers want to enforce on their apps. So the first thrust is novel nature language processing techniques that enables understanding, automatical understanding of all these unstructured documents from IRB protocol to app description, privacy policies, and data management plan. And for the second thrust, after we got the codified kind of security and privacy requirements from the first thrust, we want to run program analysis on these research apps and make sure there's no policy violation and even try to fix this research apps that has a violation to make sure it actually follows the security and privacy requirements from the first step. So this is an overview of our project. And in today's talk, I will first start with the thrust one and talk about how we use nature language processing to analyze this unstructured document like privacy policy, application description to get codified policies for the security and privacy requirements. In this part, I will talk about two projects and actually two recent papers we published. So these two papers, the first one is trying to understand the privacy policy document to look into the data practice in the privacy policy of the apps. And we prepare policy QA, a really comprehension data set for privacy policies, which is to appear in EMNLP findings, which is a top tier machine learning conference. And the second project I want to cover is trying to understand the privacy risks by analyzing app descriptions. So this TK perm paper is published on NDS 2028, which is a top tier security conference. And we are one of the five uh, top rated papers on NDS 2020. The reason why we want to look into privacy policies and app descriptions is because they actually are user facing. So they tell a lot of information about the planned security and privacy uh, practice the developers, the researchers want to do in their research apps. So without further ado, I will first talk about the policy QA, the paper about understanding privacy policy documents. So we saw lots of privacy policies for mobile apps, for websites, because especially with uh, GDPR and CCPA, this, um, this apps, no matter websites, apps, all, they are mobile apps, they are all required pro to provide privacy policies. But these privacy policies are usually very long and confusing. Previously, it was investigated and it takes a, a lot of time for typical American internet users to read the privacy policies of the, all the website he or she visit in one year. So can anyone guess like how long is usually the time? I was actually quite surprised because it takes around 244 hours a year for typical American internet users to read all the privacy policies for the website he or she visit for one year. And note this study was done like 10 years ago when there were only websites, 
now people have a lot more apps. So th the number of hours could even be longer. So that's why like almost nobody really reads the privacy policies. So there has been research trying to automatically understand the privacy policies even before we get started on the project. But even the state of art, NLP techniques and NLP data sets for interpreting privacy policy are still very limited because they will generate very long results. For example, this is an example of a state of art question answering system for understanding privacy policy. You can tell that if you ask a question, does this app save any of the health data? It actually gives you very, very long paragraphs without really tell you the right information that you are looking for. So this is still not very helpful for us because we like even if we identify, okay, this maybe previously privacy policy was 15 pages. Now we identify, oh, this one page is talking about that they save my, any of my health data. But still, we cannot easily just uh, translate into a codified policy that we can enforce directly in the code. So our goal for this project is that before we're going into the details of all this uh, fancy NLP models, we first want to provide a useful data set that people can train their NLP models on top of it. And we call this data set policy QA, which aims at provide a much shorter text span in the document that helps to answer the questions about privacy policy. On the right side, you can see the examples. For example, if the question is like, how do you collect my information? Our policy QA will, data set will answer um, information you enter on our websites. And the second example is that if the question is, is my information shared with others? The answer is shot as well. We don't give you, give that business your name and address. So this will be much more useful for extracting the security and privacy policies from this kind of privacy policy document. And now let's talk more, more details about how do we collect this data set. We ask notators to create questions relevant to different segments of privacy policies. For example, for the text span relevant to name and emails, the notators come up with questions such as what type of contact information does the company collect? Or will you use my contact information? So you can see that we give um, the user annotators very short span of text and then ask them to ask the questions. So this, we can make sure that the answer to the question is usually a short text. This page lists a few example questions for policy QA. Um, yeah, you can see that we cover lots of different types of security and privacy practices. And now let's also evaluate the policy QA data set to see if it's actually helpful for machine learning models to get better accuracy. And we use popular QA models uh, by Duff and BERT. And for the implementation, we fine tuning on the privacy policies and use SQUID, which is a common question answering data set, but it doesn't have knowledge about, um, about privacy policy but we use it for pre-training. And for the evaluation metrics, we use two common metrics for machine learning. One is exact match score. The other one is F1 score. So you can tell that in the results, BIRDS performs better than BADAF and the fun training and uh, squid pre-training helps to boost the performance. We also found that the performance gets better with larger data set. However, this is still a very challenging problem. So our currently, we also have uh, more next steps after we publish this paper. So we currently collect a much larger data set with expert annotation. The previous re uh, results uh, I just shared with you is only on around 100 privacy policies, but now we have around 2000 privacy policies. 
And we are improving the question answering schemes to extract codified policy from the privacy policies. So we can see the table here is the kind of um, how we actually eventually get the past policy content from the example policy text. So we can tell that on the right side, we get very details of actions and who asked for the information and what kind of data is asked. So this is about privacy policies. We currently have good results about privacy policies, but you might have this question. It seems to be lots of annotation efforts to actually get the privacy policy working, right? So what about if we have lots of different platforms and how actually can we actually make it work? For example, not just the, for the mobile apps, but also for other IoT apps. There are so many different kinds of uh, platforms available. And how do we really afford to do this with limited amount of data? So now I will talk about use the app description as, a, as an example to show how we use app description to actually understand the potential privacy risks in the research apps. The reason why we look into app description is that because app description represents what the user expect from the app and should be consistent with the permissions it requested to collect sensitive data. But it's not always the case. When apps ask for more information than they actually needed in the descriptions, the apps are overprivileged. Here is a real example about overprivileged apps. So the game, Gaming Hub is a Chrome extension. It's actually asked for location permission. But when we check the description of Gaming Hub, there's no explanation for the usage of location permission. So we don't know how it's gonna really need the location permission. Instead of match, it's actually a potential overprivilege. But the challenge is that you saw that we have lots of labeling efforts, annotation efforts for privacy policy. This will also include extensive data labeling and parameter turning on new platforms. And you, there are thousands of new platforms and researchers might write apps in thousands of different platforms. How can we handle this? Our project is quite, quite scalable because we have these key insights. Will these platforms operate with different use cases or have different sites of permissions? They are all user facing, thus sharing certain aspects that are transferable across platforms. That's why like we propose to use transfer learning, which is a novel machine learning algorithm that allows you to use a very well-trained model. Like for example, you have a model that had lots of data set, you already get a perfect model, but when you come into a new kind of problem, you can just use a very small amount of a new labeled data in the new platform and transfer the old perfect model to the new platform and can still make it very accurate. Our goal for this project is trying to transfer the semantic knowledge and permission knowledge from the Android platform, which we have lots of label data because there are lots of Android research apps to new apps in like new platforms like Chrome extensions and IoT apps such as SmartThings and Ift, if then that. I'm not sure if you can kind of use this smart home uh, services, but SmartThings and Ift are two popular uh, smart home service providers. You can tell that Android seem to be quite different for, from the other three platforms, but we demonstrate that they still share something in common for privacy. And we were able to actually transfer learning from Android to these three new platforms. So this is an example that we demonstrate that from Android app description, we found violations uh, which is the original domain, and they were able to transfer it to Chrome extensions and identify new problems in the Chrome extensions. However, the challenges for transfer learning are usually two parts. The first is that what knowledge to transfer? 
And second is that how to minimize amount of labeled data needed in the new platforms. This is a system overview of our transfer learning process to actually make it work. So the two most critical components are the domain selection and data selection, because we overcome these two aforementioned research questions over there. And for the domain selection, we use greedy selection approach. So to resolve the challenge, what knowledge to transfer? First, we aggregate the source domains with performance, uh, which performs the best. And then we remove source domains, which work worst, so that we can find the best combination of source domains to transfer the knowledge. So here the source domains are relevant to the privacy data, like location or contact book. So we are looking for what kind of uh, source domains are actually better for the knowledge transfer. And second, for the data selection, we also use a similar method. We want to uh, resolve the challenge, how to minimize the amount of labeled data needed. So we first use source model to rank the document and we rank unlabeled documents from the target domain and we pick up the top 20 documents from the target domain and ask human annotators to label the data. By doing this, we make sure we only need the minimum amount of labeled data. And here are the data sets. So you can tell that from for the source domain, the Android, we have lots of data, right? So, but for Chrome, we only have uh, 4,000 level data sets. For SmartSense, even worse, like around 300 sentences. For FTAT, we have around 600 sentences. However, this only a handful of data sets in this new platform actually proved to work great. So next we'll show the evaluation of this uh, transfer learning method. We have three questions we want to evaluate. First, what is the end-to-end -end performance of TKPerm? Second, what is the performance of each component in TKPerm? And third, what is the computation overhead of TKPerm? We'll first talk about evaluation on the effectiveness of TKPerm. And you can tell from this table that our source domain selection, greedy selection, works much better than state of our H diverging source domain selection. And the data selection is also pretty effective. You can see that the improvement of uh, without data selection and with data selection is actually a lot of differences. So overall, TKPerm is very accurate. You can see that we have very high like accuracy and lots of improvement um, on, the, on the model. The last question is that what's the computation overhead of TKPerm? And we show that the computation overhead is reasonable. So it's quite scalable. You might want to ask a question, how bad is app overprivilege? So we found that this app overprivilege is a pervasive issue. So over 30% of apps studied are overprivileged. You can see the detailed distribution in this new platforms. This tells us if you have researchers that write their own research apps in your institution, they might as well also make mistakes because one in three out of professional developers make such mistakes. So as researchers, we might even do worse than the case. Basically, these two projects tell us that it's possible to extract useful information about security and privacy from this unstructured document. It tells us that we can do lots of automation to identify security and privacy policies uh, from this unstructured document. So now let's think about what will be the next step for our project in the first trust. We are currently extending the transfer learning techniques to other platforms as well, and it has been successful. And we're also exploring the transfer learning idea on other policy documents, such as privacy policies, IRB documents, and data management plans. We look forward to collaboration in these areas because the more data we have, the more accurate the model is. And we'll be happy to share our 
um, data set, of course, all anonymized and remove sensitive data. And also uh, our code for getting this kind of analysis working together. So now we switch gear and talk about second thrust, how we check the policy violation with program analysis. So after getting this kind of codified security and privacy policies from the first thrust, we also want to vet this research apps for potential policy violations. So here I will only talk about one example that we do to find out um, privacy violations on IoT apps that IoT apps actually ask for, uh, actually collect more information than actually needed. And uh, we actually have lots of work in enforcing policies for mobile apps and websites. For example, enforcing uh, GDPR policies on mobile apps and websites as well, but we probably don't have time to go into details of, of this. The reason why I want to use IoT app as an example is that because smart home applications are getting very popular, I currently also have lots of smart home devices in my house, uh, but I know they are risky because once an attacker gets into your house, it actually can control all the devices and get lots of sensitive information about you. So the problem here is that users of these apps might not be aware of the risks. As we know that users will only probably only read the descriptions of the apps when they install apps. But actually, when the apps are running in the cloud, there's no guarantee that the functionality explained to the user is actually the same as the behaviors of uh, the smart home devices. It's the same problem our IRB office actually running into because IRB office only sees the IRB policy and also description of the research apps. They actually don't have the capability to really review code uh, line by line about the code of the research apps to make sure they really follow the IRB policy and their app descriptions. Okay, so what we do in this work is that we want to be able to make sure we actually got insights about real security and um, privacy behaviors in the apps, and then be able to tell the user or our IRB office about potential privacy violation in the research app. But this is actually a challenging task. Um, there are several challenges about the IoT specific things, such as the security and privacy implication is deeply correlated with context here for IRB application, oh, sorry, for the IoT apps. Like for example, read the motion sensor could mean different things when the contact is the door of the bedroom. And the behaviors in the code cannot be mapped directly to the high level functionality in the descriptions. Even after we get the codified policy, the behaviors in the code is also provide much more details. So you actually have to bridge the gap between this high level abstraction and the low level implementation. And since this work is about IoT apps, it's also need to support cross device scenarios. And the previous solutions will not work because they cannot really meet all these features we want to have like context aware, automatic and useful and secure. So we have to design new interfaces and also new enforcement scheme to make it work. We have several goals for this project. We want to make sure the research apps share minimum amount of data and capability for the desired functionality. We want to be IoT specific. We want to support cross device context-based automated control. We also want to make it useful to help the users like the research participants to make well-informed decisions and minimize user burdens. We also want to have good performance like it should be lightweight and compatible. This is an overview of this smart auth project. First, we run program analyzer to understand the logic in the app code. And then we run the NLP analysis to actually analyze app description. This is similar to the NDSS paper we talked about in the last thrust. And then we run a consistency checker to check the security and privacy behaviors in the code and in the description so that we can generate the security and privacy policy 
to to let users decide if they are willing to send the data. And then we build end to end the policy enforcement to make sure that the apps don't violate the security and privacy requirements. This is a simple example here. So we are talking about an example that an IoT app tells you, I will make you a cup of coffee after you taking a shower. So, but actually it's actually doing things more dangerous. I will show you how we identify this uh, very risky behavior. So you can see that this tells the user like there's a capability relative humidity measurement trying to take the measurement of humidity sensor in the bathroom. So there's a location context in the code notation talking about bathroom relevant to humidity sensor. And we also saw the conditions uh, in the code basically tell people when the sh shower, when the humidity is above a threshold, turn on the coffee machine. And here we want to show you how we correlate uh, the description with the implementation in the code. First, for the description analysis, we have two entities, shower machine and, uh, and, and the co coffee machine. And for the program analysis, we actually found three entities, the switch, the humidity sensor, and the lock. And then remember we have this context clue so that we'll be able to match the bathroom for the humidity sensor and coffee for the switch. So now this blue entity is actually matched. And then we look into the conditions. Uh, on the left, it's taking a shower. On the right, it's humidity reading above a threshold. So this can be matched. And then we look into the triggers, got the actions. So in the description analysis, only turn on the coffee machine, but in the program analysis, we found that it's instead of just um, make you a coffee, it's also unlock your door. So this is a risky behavior we identified that's violate the security and privacy policy defined in the description. And we produce good interfaces that is quite understandable to the user. And we build end-to-end -end policy enforcement that makes sure this app only gets the enough amount of data the user wants it to collect so that it follows the privacy um, policy. We do that by, uh, by instrument the app's code to actually instrument the part like collecting data and sending data. For the next steps, while working on checking policy violations on mobile apps and websites, we also have recent papers published in these areas as well. So basically, we're also extending the policy enforcement to include regulations such as GDPR. I'm more than happy to discuss about the details and also for people who are interested in how to do really do policy enforcement on different platforms. And I want to acknowledge our co-PIs for this project, uh, Professor Kai Wei Chang from UCLA, Professor Yan Zhuang from UCCS, and Dr. Bing Di Kim from USC. And as I just mentioned, we are very interested in collaborations. And I'll be happy to be here to discuss about policy enforcement and other relevant work. And the data sets and the software from our papers will also be available. You can always reach out to me by my email address here. And also you can check out my website for more information regarding the security and privacy work we have done. Here's an overview of my research summary. I, I work in the inter interaction of systems, security and privacy and machine learning. Uh, we publish in top tier conferences um, and my work has been um, moved into real implementations such as Android, Chrome, um, Firefox as well. So we are excited for potential collaborations uh, across different uh, universities and also different industry partners as well. So this is the end of my talk. Um, I'll be happy to take any questions. Thank you so much for coming. I know it's a busy Monday morning and thanks a lot for sparing your time listening to my talk today. Great, thanks. I'm gonna grab the screen back uh, briefly uh, while people are typing and just kind of go over a couple of updates related to Trusted CI. So let me just grab the screen back. Um, 
So um, yes, uh, this is the uh, question and answer portion of the session. So if you have a question, please type it, um, click on the chat icon to type it in and we'll get through them. Um, we have a few community updates related to Trusted CI. Our next webinar is Monday, December 7th. You'll notice it's we don't have one for November because we try to thread the needle between the two big holidays. So look out for our updates um, uh, in late November to join our Monday, or sorry, Monday, December 7th webinar at 11 a.m. Eastern. Our topic is a panel discussion with the Trustworthy Data Working Group. Um, for those of you who might have been following along, um, we've been working on our Trustworthy Data uh, project for the past year, and so we will be wrapping up um, the, the efforts of that, of that working group um, during that webinar. And then also, um, for those of you who are interested, our 2021 Fellows Program application window is still open. We are accepting applications um, until November 6th. So if you're interested in that, please go to trustedci.org slash fellows. And if you have any questions for us or want to see older uh, or previous webinars, you can go to trustedci.org slash webinars, um, or you can email us at webinars at trustedci for questions, suggested topics, and other areas of interest regarding our webinars. And with that, let's go to the chat. Um, We've got a comment here, great talk. Have you worked in medical or clinical IoT privacy and security yet, or would you be interested in that? We have an IEEE UL working group uh, developing standards for clinical IoT and TIPPSS, trust, identity, privacy, perfect, protection, mm -hmm. safety, and security. <laughs> yeah, so that's nice. Thanks Florence for the question. Yes, we're actually looking to the medical part of IoT privacy and security. Uh, we have a paper like that will appear and you become this year talking about medical apps on Amazon Alexa and Google Home. So we found that um, there were lots of uh, medical apps on this new IoT platforms that they don't comply with HIPAA, but they collect lots of uh, sensitive healthcare data. So it's actually a really bad condition. We also found that these medical apps, they try to provide medical device suggestions to the users, but they are providing not very useful medical suggestions and sometimes could even be misleading. I believe this kind of medical or clinical IoT security and privacy is a very important area for future work um, because it's actually the trend because uh, lots of uh, IoT devices with their different sensors, like for example, Alexa, they can listen to your cough. There are also like smartwatch that can monitor uh, your, your health conditions. So we definitely want to do very well in the security and privacy of these apps. And I'd be happy to learn more about your working group. Um, and Florence, uh, feel free to like email me so that we can set up uh, something like to talk more about this. I'll be happy to send you our relevant uh, paper as well. Yeah, and by the way, I also saw another question from uh, Jim. Uh, mm -hmm. His first question is, uh, do, do you have advice for those of us developing research apps and also can private policy QA and smart house actually help us write clear privacy policies? So yeah, I think for developing research apps, uh, you probably want to look into the best security and privacy practices. Um, I'll be happy to share some of the practices. The first is that before you even start writing code, you should think about what kind of sensitive data you might be collecting and why are you collecting this and how do you really want to use uh, this data. Be very careful, be very cautious because um, some, some kind of data might sound not sensitive to you, but they are actually very uh, sensitive to certain kinds of people. And of course, after finishing writing the code, trying to do code review among uh, the team to make sure that you are not over collecting or you don't have very obvious vulnerabilities. And for someone who actually developing larger research apps, it's also, you also want to make sure that you support deleting the data that the, the users can actually uh, let you know that they want to delete the data and you should make sure you'll be able to delete the data and this unlink the data from their ID. 
Um, so for the writing clear privacy policies, we actually current also have a project to generate privacy policies uh, from, from the app. So basically, if you, you, you want to provide the code, we can actually generate privacy policies for you that clearly state um, kind of like it's sim similar to a template, but we clearly state what kind of data and how do you actually treat the data for the privacy policies. Um, there's, as, as I, I, I mentioned, there's also lots of work that should be done on the privacy policy part to help developers and also to, to help the secure research, uh, research enforcement on this uh, research apps. Um, and Jim have a second question, uh, talk about thinking about extending research to other platforms. Um, yeah, so you also talk about OAuth scope values uh, and ask me, have I looked into OAuth apps? Actually, I look into lots of OAuth apps. When I was a PhD student, um, one of, uh, well, my most cited paper at that time was actually about demystify OAuth, mobile OAuth um, uh, development. So we talk about lots of uh, security and privacy issues about mo mobile OAuth apps. And we found over 70% of mobile OAuth apps have at least one security issue that leads to like account breach. So I think these scopes um, are also very similar to permissions and should be, um, we can actually address this using similar techniques I talked uh, in the seminar. But I'm particularly interested in OAuth protocol because this kind of uh, third party authentication authorization protocols uh, actually very complex and difficult for user to do. And uh, recently, uh, one of my PhD students actually published a paper talking about how do you actually verify this kind of OAuth implementation for security and privacy issues. If you want to check it out, that's ASC 2019. So we are still very actively working on OAuth. If people are interested, uh, discuss on um, like OAuth or OpenID Connect as well. Great, um, we still have some time for questions. Um, and I will ask a question that I was kind of bouncing off of Jim <laughs> during the presentation. Um, so, I really like the first half where you were explaining the, the natural language processing and trying to parse these very difficult to understand, at least for many people, difficult to understand security mm -hmm. policies. So um, I apologize if this is cynical or out of scope, but uh, I was just wondering if this is just teaching um, lawyers to write more difficult to parse policies. <laughs> Yeah, so I think that's also a very important um, part we should handle because I noticed there are startups that are trying to help people, uh, help companies, especially small business to comply with GDPR. And then they will provide this kind of templates that basically says nothing. Really say just like for people to get rid of uh, like potential policy violations. Uh, for example, we found some of the apps just tell people, oh, we are collecting your voice data for a lot of potential uh, practices. So they're, they're, they're bad is that nobody reads the privacy policy. So even if, uh, when something bad happened and then they go back to look into a privacy policy and check, oh, it's already covered. So I think that's why instead of just a privacy policy, we should also look into other like user facing part that user more likely to read. Like for example, the app description, when I'm trying to install an app, I usually check what kind of functionality it provides. So it actually helps me to have expectation about how much data is being collected from this app. So instead of just a privacy policy, the other documents relevant to the app also tells us what kind of data should be collected. It's a privacy policy usually probably tell you a, a more vague or broader scap but app descriptions are probably more specific. That's also why instead of just looking into the privacy policy, which sounds like most relevant, but we also look into other parts of the app. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's a very good point. Um, more can be revealed by looking at these other parts of the app. Yes, yes, yeah. Okay, let's do uh, one more round for questions uh, before we wrap things up. Um, Yuan, do you have any more um, comments or, or final thoughts? 
Yeah, so I think my final thoughts, uh, we got awarded for this grant in 2019. We have been working on it for about one year. Um, and most of my thoughts about like, I'm just scared how bad the condition is in the current just app development process. Uh, we really need to train our students, the future developers to uh, have better understanding about the potential security and privacy risks and also be careful about uh, who should be responsible. I, I really like earlier like people's comments like from developers to users, everyone is responsible for these things. Um, yeah, so, so basically I, I believe it's a lot of teaching and education and training are needed to really make it work. And in the meantime, I do believe this kind of automation such as natural language processing and program analysis can make our life much easier. We have demonstrated the success stories on different kind of platforms. And I believe in the future, we probably have a better IRB kind of procedure that once people submit the form and we submit the research app, we'll be able to tell the researcher, oh, there's uh, something you should not collect, but you actually collect. And here's our tool to help you to fix this. This is the eventual vision of our project and we are already making lots of good, good progress on that. And I definitely hope I can also collaborate with other institutions and with other areas of experts together on this. So feel free to shoot me an email. Uh, and uh, I think I can just uh, type my email address here again. Yeah, so, oh, sorry, I only, Send it to to tonight. Yeah. yeah, sorry. Yeah. The de yeah. the default always sends privately instead of publicly. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. I yeah, prefer so, the other way. Yes, yes. It, it's actually better. It's actually privacy preserving. <laughs> oh, that's so true. I don't type something <laughs> random to all the panelists. So <laughs> that's true. I typed my yes, definitely. That's a good security setting you have. So I typed my email address here. I'm definitely open to discussions and uh, collaborations. Great. Well, this was a great presentation, very thought provoking, um, and your research is very interesting. So I look forward to seeing uh, where the project goes in the next few years. Um, thank you, everybody, for uh, watching this presentation. And thank you again, Yuan, for presenting. Thank you so much, Jeanette, for having me. And thanks to everyone for like staying for the seminar. I know it's quite early, especially for people uh, on, the, on the West Coast. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. It's very nice uh, talking to you. Yes, thank you, everyone. Um, I, w I will be posting this video, hopefully, uh, by the end of the day. Um, and with that, we will end the presentation. Bye-bye, everybody. Bye-bye, everybody. Bye. -bye, everybody. Bye.